Those were telling the gunny tomorrow's going to be different. Tomorrow's demonstration's going to be different. But they didn't say exactly how different. But I asked the gunny, they seemed awfully concerned. He goes, oh, they come by every week. You know, a couple million people march by, chant. Sometimes they jump over the wall and the militia will take them out. But he said, tomorrow's no different than any other day. But he said, we are going to be busy till about noon, so don't come over and check in until about 1 o'clock. So I, um, but I was, I was not concerned. I was literally thought I'd made a mistake. I, when I came, I thought, what could be more interesting than witness a revolution from the safety of the U.S. Embassy? When I got there, I thought, you know, we're in a city of a couple million people, and it appears everybody hates us, and we stand out like a sore thumb. Huge profile in the better part of North Iran, where all the kind of wealth starts. The slums are to the south. Um, I went to bed that night, didn't sleep very well, you know, jet lag, mm-hmm. been up a couple of days. Uh, I, I, was, I was tired when I left Budapest. Um, and I was still tired, and I was in the shower the next morning about 9.30, I think it was, and a Marine kicked the door open and said, we're being attacked, they've called, um, they've called us all back to the embassy. By the time I, I dumped the sea bag, I didn't have any clothes out. I dumped the sea bag and put on a uniform, didn't pick up my ID card, my passport, but by the time I got dressed, they'd already cut off the south side of the embassy. Our guards are smoking cigarettes, talking to the attacking guards, the attacking people. Um, we could identify them because they had a string around their neck with a white laminated piece of paper. And it was in Farsi, I didn't know what it meant, but um, later on they told me that stood for the students following the imam's line. So once the door was kicked down and you had cleared your bag to try to find some clothes to put on after arriving the night before, what happened from there? Did you uh, stay put? Yeah, since I couldn't recall, we went to the, there was one apartment in, in the top of the embassy that was sort of the Marine social area. We had a bar and chairs and things. So we, that was our gathering point if we couldn't get to the embassy. So we went there, uh, we observed what we could see, and talked on the radio to people at the embassy. I did notice that we knew, knew something was bad because suddenly we heard Iranian voices on our radio. Um, I don't know if they had them from before, they, they hadn't changed the crystals, but we could hear them breaking in. Um, I was a senior Marine, but the newest Marine, but that still made me in charge. I asked the three other Marines with me, four other Marines. We could hear that we finally heard them start breaking down doors, and I asked Curtly, um, Jim Curtly, I said, do you guys know where a Western Embassy is? And they said, yeah, we didn't know where they're all at. So I called um, the political officer was in charge, Ann Swift. And I said, you know, I'm here with three other Marines. Is it okay if we go out the back? I think we can get out the back and go to a Western Embassy. He said, no, no, help's on the way. We don't want people scattered all over the, over town. And along that way, we'd heard that most of the people got out of the front. The consulate was a separate building. It was attached to the embassy, but the door was on the street to make it more convenient. So those, we could hear those people getting out. Jimmy Lopez was still in the consulate because they were coming in through the second floor. Um, he th- threw tear gas, they told him not to, and he's, I think his response is, whoops, too late. Um, but they were asking us to do absolutely nothing to resist or create a, something more difficult than they're already in. Um, so they kicked our door down, they captured us, um, and there were weapons. Um, you know, Marines in the embassy said they could see women with rifles under their shed doors. Uh, the guy that came with us had a pistol. Um, we broke our radios so they couldn't have them and we got captured. Now we went down about two floors. I think we're on the seventh floor of the Bijan apartments. Went down about two floors and a group of gendarmes, the national police showed up. And compared to local police, they, were, they appeared very professional. They had sharp uniforms, were well-dressed, in good condition. And an argument ensued between the policemen and the people capturing us. The only word I could understand was Khomeini. Um, pretty soon one of the guard, one of the policemen pointed his rifle at me and motioned me to raise my hands. I thought, good, they're gonna capture us and we'll be safe. And I put my hands back up and they left. I think the threat of offending Khomeini was too great. And the gentleman in charge looked 
I mean, he looked terribly embarrassed. Um, and my thought before was, let's make a pretty good story home. You know, I write a letter, you know, we almost got captured and we got saved. And we went downstairs, and, and as we are being captured, we went through the gate. Uh, our guards did, our paid guards did nothing. And I remember seeing a wave of people running at us, and they were frothing at the mouth, I know. I mean, that might be an exaggeration, but I'd never seen people with such hatred in their face. And um, they got us to, um, we call them little yellow houses. They were uh, itinerant housing. If somebody was TAD, they got a little yellow house to stay in. And that's where I was first captured.